There's a reason they call them pseudo-random number generators. So Stan, I understand you're going to talk to us about uh, a bit of a tongue twister today uh, regarding Mersenne twisters. Uh, yes. So this holiday season, like every holiday season, we're blessed with the uh, Sands holiday hack. And for the past three years, they kind of rebranded a little bit as KringleCon. Uh, so it's become this virtual conference that you can attend where you can um, – uh, hear about new developments in computer security, like maybe new exploits or uh, new things um, that are kind of on the coming up. Um, and um, it's my favorite way to learn uh, because you get to try hands-on labs, and it's almost like this little hacking competition. Uh, and the other reason I love it because it looks like a video game. So the whole time you're playing this game. You're walking around in this amazing storyline that Ed Scotus and the counterhack team at SANS have created, and uh, you're, you're learning how to hack, and you're doing it hands-on, and you're get, watching some amazing talks. So this year, uh, Tom Liston uh, gave a pretty uh, awesome presentation about uh, Mersenne Twisters. Now, if you're not familiar with what that is, it has to do with pseudo-random number generators. So we all know in security, you know, randomness is important. How do you achieve it, and uh, how do you build that in? So different operating systems, they have mechanisms for generating entropy or generating random numbers. You use this randomness to pick things like if you were going to make a video game uh, that, you know, like let's say plays poker, uh, you need to shuffle the deck. How do you make sure the deck is random each time? Or if you need to pick a, a random key, uh, for your password or whatever generation algorithm or something like that, or for your signing key or something like that. So you need randomness for all of that. But how do you make a computer generate random numbers? So there's ways to do it, and uh, one of the ways is something called a Mersenne twister. It was invented um, in 1997, I believe, uh, or first introduced in 1997, and it was uh, implemented in several languages that many people use as a, as a way to have the language be able to generate random numbers but not have to rely on the operating system. Uh, so some of the common languages you might know that do this are Python, Ruby, R, PHP. So languages that are in common use, uh, programming languages, and whenever you need to get a random number, um, you know, they use this algorithm to provide it. Well, what's amazing is that Tom, he, I guess, looked at this algorithm, looked at its implementation, and figured out something very, very interesting, very, very unique, I thought it was, is that if you observe a sequence of 624 random 32-bit integers being generated in a program, right after that, you can clone the pseudo-random number generator, and you can guess what the 625th 32-bit value will be, or the, the, all the ones after that, basically. Uh, and it's really that easy. It's just you're able to see these random numbers. Now, the random numbers, you might think, it, you know, they're supposed to be random. How can you take you know, a stream of randomness if you just take these 32-bit numbers or, uh, or integers and you just all you need is about 600 of them? and you've observed that, how can you clone the PARNG? Um, so uh, it's, uh, it's possible, and Tom has showed us the way. He's released some code. Um, it's really exciting. And if you enjoy doing things hands-on like I do, um, then playing the SANS holiday hack, it'll show you exactly uh, how to utilize this technique, how to use the source code, how it's applicable in code, and how you can defeat um, certain, um, I guess, schemes or randomness schemes um, by being able um, to, to do this. And they have really fun challenges uh, that I'm pretty sure Tom uh, built and put together. I'm still not done with all of them. Uh, I still have a little bit of time to finish, uh, but I'm almost done, and they're incredible. They're a lot of fun, and they use this, um, uh, this you know, it's hard to say it's a flaw necessarily, but it's something that 
It's just a property of, you know, pseudo-random number generators. They produce pseudo-random numbers, and the numbers are evenly distributed and, and things like that. They're statistically sound, but they might have this insecurity that you might not consider. So it's just something to remember when you're trying to build, like, security into your game or security into your, um, I don't know, like, crypto, uh, and you're picking random number generators. This is one now that we know it has this weakness. Um, it's you know for security purposes. So um, really cool uh, work, really amazing. I always find um, uh, this kind of math uh, that people do behind the scenes that it's hard to grasp. Uh, amazing that there's somebody out there who can look at the code, look at the math, and be like, "Yep, I know how to reverse this because it looks like a mess on the way in." Uh, but they're somehow able to just reverse it, and, and uh, the results kind of speak for themselves. Uh, it's a really great talk as well, and I, I uh, encourage everyone to check out uh, the YouTube video uh, where Tom talks about it firsthand. Yeah, well, the the key there is it's pseudo-random number generation. So it's algorithmically generating these numbers that have some nice properties. But if you can figure out, you know, the, it, it, with most pseudo random number generators, if you can figure out the seed, you can figure out all of the, all of the random numbers that it generates. And so in this case, you know, even without a seed, if you can get the first 624 random values, that's enough to, you know, basically reverse engineer the seed and from there you can get them all so yeah i mean it's it's a fascinating talk and it's a you know fascinating topic if you're interested in in crypto and the mathematics behind it so yeah i i agree it's tom did good work again yeah yeah awesome work <laughs> um yeah i definitely encourage everyone to um to check it out and uh, for applications there's the challenges are there and you can kind of see, I think one of the challenges is you kind of break blo the blockchain uh, for the Santa Claus naughty nice list. <laughs> and it uses these random numbers. Uh, and the reason I love it is because uh, Tom doesn't just throw in the random number stuff into it. Uh, that is obviously amazing by itself. But he also added a challenge with breaking MD5 uh, as part of this blockchain uh, challenge. So. Um, if for people who enjoy this kind of thing, uh, definitely, again, check it out. It's a lot of fun, and it, it kind of showcases um, a lot of security issues that um, we do have to deal with daily. And I know that sometimes people are like, no, nah, these numbers are random. It's okay. And we've been doing this uh, forever, you know. But this is, you know, a proof of, uh, uh, of it not being as safe as some people might think. What stands out to me about this is that, um, the particular algorithm in question has been in wide and very, very popular use for over 20 years, right? And so this issue has been present for that entire time. It's not like it was, you know, a recent update that could cause this issue. And so this brings into question really the life cycle of algorithms because you have other examples of this, right? I mean, RSA even you know, had collisions that were discovered after many, many years of it being in wide use. And, and so you see this, and as computing power continues to expand and continues to grow, and as we're on the cusp of a quantum computing age, I think we're going to see more examples of this kind of thing where algorithms that held true under a certain level of computing power or, um, you know, analysis are suddenly going to start to show some cracks as more rigorous analysis is able to be brought to the table. And I think that, you know, as professionals, that's something that we're going to need to keep an eye on because this ties right into your supply chain issue. It ties right into some very, very large um, issues that are very, very hard uh, to, to grasp as a security professional defending your enterprise. You know, how do you ensure that these algorithms aren't in use or aren't continued to be supported or aren't vulnerable to rollback attacks or downgrade attacks 
in the software that you're using or the, the products that you're basing your business on. Yeah, it's a very good point. Uh, you know, a lot of people probably understand, you know, a lot of like what software is running in their environment. Some people might even understand the components of that software, like the libraries, like OpenSSL and things like that. But probably no one is really keeping track of the algorithms that make up the software components that make up the software installed on all these assets. Um, so I think you're totally right there, Mike. We'll all have to kind of adjust our thinking as we go forward.